So thank you for being here. Thank you to our speakers and to our panel for agreeing to share their wisdom today and their insight. Um, a huge thank you goes to Moni and Holly for um, taking what was a really abstract idea and a name on a piece of paper um, in terms of Lady Phil and turning it into, into an event today. Before I introduce um, Mark Power, just some um, housekeeping. Um, if the fire alarm sounds and continues to sound for longer than 60 seconds, something is probably on fire. So we need to vacate this lecture theatre and make your way out of the building. Um, smoking isn't permitted um, inside um, uh, in terms of vapes or outside within five metres of the reference building. So if you want to smoke, you need to kind of move away from that area. We will be taking photographs today. If you do not wish to have your photograph taken, you need to alert um, one of our team. Uh, there are a few of us kind of dotted around. And if you're a tweeter, please um, tweet away using at Equality and the hashtag LGBTQ plus 2019. Can I also ask that any questions um, for any of our speakers today are saved until the end. So if you have a burning question, if you, you want to write it down, please feel free to do so. But we will save time at the end for a long Q&A session, so save those questions. Can I now invite uh, the interim VC and the chief executive of LGMU, Mark Power, to welcome you and to introduce our main speaker for today, Lady Phil. Uh, thank you, Emma, and uh, a big thank you to, to Moni, actually, for, for the invitation and the opportunity to, uh, to, to open this event this afternoon. And, of course, to Lady Phil for taking the time to, to come and talk to us. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the lunch uh, upstairs, uh, and I'm looking forward to the, to the session this afternoon. Uh, I have to say, I, I'm really sort of proud to be here, and I, I, I would echo Emma's comments that I think as an institution, we are very proud of the work that we undertake uh, in, in ensuring that we do have as much of an effort behind uh, all of the issues around equality. And, and there are lots of inequalities across our society that we, we, we do need to address. Uh, so we're delighted this afternoon to be joined by, as I say, Lady Phil, Executive Director and, and Co-Founder of UK Black Pride. Uh, to speak on the topic of intersectionality of race, gender and class. And I'm sure you'll find that a very, very interesting session this afternoon. She has just mentioned she's a little bit nervous, so you can be gentle. Uh, I'm sure she'd appreciate it. But the themes of uh, equality, diversity and inclusivity are becoming clearly more, more prominent and, and indeed you could say confrontational in our daily lives. Uh, as the media forces us to, to witness and observe behaviour, that demands, demands of us that we challenge and change. And, and I think that's a particularly important aspect for us all to consider uh, within our daily lives. And, and the focus of, of Lady Phil's address today uh, clearly reflects that, that radical thinking that's needed to ensure that people, regardless of their characteristics, should be treated with absolute dignity and respect. And this forum today allows us to pause and think, debate the key issues, and, and start to develop the ideas out of which may come some new thinking and, and fresh approaches, or indeed more harebrained suggestions <laughs> from Emma. Uh, I think in a university, and particularly a university like John Moore's, it's, it's our role to provide a very safe platform for different people from every community to come together, to speak openly, to, to address issues. We don't have all of the answers, I don't think anybody does, and we can't solve all of the world's problems. But I think we can be optimistic and supportive in providing the sort of environment that allows people to, the, the freedom to shape, shape ideas. And at Liverpool John Moore's University, we aim to work as a community in an atmosphere of, of dignity and deep respect. So the contribution of our LGBT staff network in promoting equality uh, in the university has made a significant impact. Working alongside our equality, diversity and inclusivity team to raise awareness and, and helping to promote equality across the whole university. We now have equality champions represented in all faculties and divisions 
charged with making sure that the issue around equality and diversity and the strategies that we're adopting are all actioned at the local levels. And this is crucial in making sure that our activities, the policy developments and the projects meet the needs of everybody in the university. And I think that's a very important feature. And next week we're about to launch our Respect Always initiative. Not just a campaign, but it's a pledge that staff and students at this university can be confident that this is a university in which respect is understood and an integral part of our everyday activities. That, in an organisation of this size and complexity, is a challenge. We should not underestimate the challenge. What we have to give, I think, uh, our undertaking that people can have confidence <coughs> that, that we would support that. We have a proud history of being inclusive and making everyone feel connected, feel welcome, comfortable and accepted, whether they're studying here, working here, or working with us as, as partner organisations. Respect Always is about ensuring that we maintain and develop this approach across all areas of university life. And we will use the campaign to shine a light on the questions of respect which touch everyone. Everyone in terms of the, our diversity and inclusion and goes to the heart of what makes us a truly open, tolerant and warming, welcoming community. We'll continue to raise the profile of equality, diversity and inclusivity through every channel available to us. Not because of legislative requirements, this is something I think as an organisation that we truly, truly believe in. It's, it, we believe it is the right thing to do. We're passionate about protecting and promoting the rights of every citizen in our community and in those communities that we serve. The university is a, is a very progressive institution and I'm sure colleagues would agree that we challenge our own community to take action and engage with all of the agendas. For example, we have research projects to inform government policies on LGBT equality through our Centre for Public Health and the School of Humanities and Social Science. We ensure that LGBT staff are able to access the Stonewall Talent Programmes to develop their leadership skills. We sponsor the annual Liverpool Pride event as a major visible support for LGBT equality. We actively promote regional LGB activities and events that our staff and our students and alumni can participate and engage with celebrations and thought leadership masterclasses. We have clear priorities. Overseeing at the top of the organisation for increasing the diversity of our recruitment of staff and to ensure that we reflect the society and the communities that we actually serve. So let me conclude by acknowledging the good work undertaken here and ensure that inclusivity is for all. This is a team effort led by our own EDI team, with, with Molly, and of course the Student Union, with the full support of our staff networks, our academic and professional service teams. My message to you all is that the organisations represented here today are what we need to take the challenge forward. <laughs> Confront inequality, celebrate diversity at every single opportunity. So, a final thank you for coming today and I truly hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you. I think it's my job now to introduce Monica. <coughs> Don't clap yet, you don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> really bad. So I take it that this is my... That's a test. <laughs> 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 I promise I didn't do it. It's a really nice picture and I thought, how am I going to look like that today? <laughs> 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 
So, well, firstly, thank you very, very much for the invitation to come and speak here. You know, I've absolutely been treated like royalty. You know, I'm not really a lady appointed by the Queen. You know, I, it's a nickname called Lady Phil, so I just decided to own it and claim it and run with it. So, thank you very much, Moni, Emma, Holly, you know, you guys have been brilliant. I wish that everywhere that I was going to speak that I would be looked after in that way so I really appreciate you know the care and understanding my nerves it's always daunting when you start to speak to somebody because you actually have to come out again and again and again and you know just for anyone that might have been mistaken I'll come out I am a black woman <laughs> I'm very proud African lesbian woman. So, you know, um, so the, the topic of today is intersectionality, race, gender, and class, campaigning for inclusion, uh, equality, and justice and freedom. I think you know when we use the word intersectionality, I think some people have used it as a buzzword, and it's like they misconstrued in, in a way that it means diversity where it's not so we'll come on to that but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and I know it's in the program so yeah I know you always use the best pictures don't you right <laughs> so I you know I put calm and composed. I like to come across like I'm calm and composed. Right now, you know, the nerves are going, I just want to undo the bra and feel relaxed. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. But I am a grassroots activist. I am not an academic. I say things that make people feel uncomfortable. I don't always get things right. I will talk about those things such as Let's talk about white privilege. Let's talk about fragility. Let's talk about dominance and subordination. Let's talk about sexism and misogyny and everything that makes our everyday lived experience and lives ever so busy. And I always talk about being busy being black. And I make no apology for being one bad ass black woman who will boot down the door at every given opportunity when I feel that you do not want to let me in. And I think that's really more about the people who have come before me. You know, they didn't stay silent for me to have a space here and a platform to be able to speak to you. So if there's anything in this conversation that we have, you take something away from it, I'll be ever so grateful. And you don't have to agree with me, but when I make those odd little jokes, just so just a, a bit about me. I'm um, I am part of a group called Justice for Gay Africans, which looks to support um, LGBT plus people um, in and around this country, but also abroad. <coughs> I'm a mentor to two young people. Um, one is a survivor of domestic violence, and the other is a young boy who believes the system has failed him. And <coughs> by the system, he feels that education and the judicial system has failed him. Um, I've been on various committees and appointed to um, a number of committees on the TUC, that's the Trade Union Congress, um, one which was the LGBT, and the other was the race relations. I'm a very, very proud trade unionist, and um, I work for the largest civil service trade union, as well as being a member of a GMB union. Um, <coughs> my parents, who are two of the most amazing people you could meet, although my mother is the Ghanaian version of Hyacinth Bouquet. Um, <laughs> she's, yeah, she's, she's interesting. <laughs> you know, we use the word interesting when you don't really know what to say about it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a civil servant by profession, so I started in the civil service when it was called the DHSS. I know you're probably thinking, 
21. <laughs> <laughs> Dear, what does she know about that? Yes, I just look very, very good. <laughs> My age. And, um, you know, it was a very bureaucratic, antiquated way of working in the DHSS. Then I went on to the Benefits Agency, Job Centre, Job Centre Plus, Employment Service, and so forth. Um, and as I mentioned, my day job, I'm the Head of Equality and Learning for PCS and I absolutely love working for a trade union. I feel that's where I'm most at home. Um, I've most recently been appointed as the patron of AKT, which is the Albert Kennedy Trust. The Albert Kennedy Trust does some amazing work at looking at homeless young people. And um, you know, when you think about nearly 58% of the young people that they support are BAME, Black and Asian Minority Ethnic. For me, that, that rang true of the work that needs to be done. You know, in this day and age, nobody should be homeless. No young person should be thrown out or you know, marginalized or ostracized from their family because they are LGBT plus. So I'm proud to be a patron there. I'm also the co-founder of UK Black Pride and uh, the executive director, which we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, most recently, I have just edited, co-edited a book called The Sister Anthology. You know, that's a that shameless plug, which I'm going to say you should have my book. It's uh, 31 stories, poems, writings of uh, queer women of colour with the connections to the UK. They tell their stories, they are, it's powerful, it's telling, it's emotive, it's, it's liberating because we're talking about celebration, we're talking about pain, struggle, we're talking about success, we're talking about our everyday lives. And um, I think one of my most important jobs, you know, I had to look down for it to remind me, I'm a mother. <laughs> <laughs> debt is there from his daughter going to uni and um, she is uh, an amazing young person she's 24 yeah I know right you're <laughs> <laughs> all thinking Monty, you've got some woman in that looks really young <laughs> I have to tell myself that the scaffolding is holding it all up, but I am, I am a very happy person. My, my daughter, who has graduated from Canterbury University, she does me proud every single day. You know, I keep on saying to her, you know, if you're LGBT or queer, you can tell me. No, Mum, it's not hereditary. It's, um, I have to support and be a great ally, but it's not hereditary. But she makes sure every single day that she steps in a way that is so positive that she understands the work that we set out to do with UK Black Pride means that she has to continue that too, regardless of whether she is LGBT or not. So I'm very proud of her. So I, in 2016, there was an award and nomination which was to be given to me um, by the Queen. And that was the MBE. And some of you may know that um, I gracefully, after the seventh letter that I wrote, turned it down. <laughs> um, and I take nothing away from anybody who has an MBE, CBE, OBE. That is, it's a personal choice to accept it. But for me, with the work that I do with UK Black Pride, with the fact that there are still countries in the Commonwealth which torture, persecute, and kill LGBT people like myself, with the fact that colonialism leaves such a toxic legacy, with the fact that I despise the word empire, I couldn't possibly accept anything that elevates itself over the people that I set out to serve. And, you know, for my mother, she was, she was beside herself because she didn't get to go to the palace with a matching bag and the shoes and the big guinea on her head. You know. However, you know, years, years have gone by, a couple of years have gone by, and she has finally got to tolerance stage with me. And I, you know, tolerance for me, that's, from my mother, that's a really big thing, because you have to understand there is no word for lesbian and gay in my language. And when your parents and parents' parents and their parents' parents have only ever known 
sodomy laws that exist in their country, why would they accept that LGBT is right? Why would they think that they should be proud of somebody that uh, is, could be criminalized for who they are? So my mother is at tolerance stage now, and she's like, oh, so you've got a special friend. <laughs> it's fine, I'm happy with special friend. You know, before there was no acknowledgement or understanding that actually I'm a lover of women and there shouldn't be anything wrong in that. So in order to help my mother understand, not so much my father, he's very liberal, um, not politics liberal, but very liberal as himself. He, my mother is, I think she's really trying. And I know that there are things that I will never try and impose on her. However, I have to explain to her in the sense that, I mean, when you first came to this country, and you told me that the only people that would house you in Stoke Newington and Islington were Jewish people because you would see signs, no dogs, no Irish, no blacks. She'd be like, ah, ah, it was so bad, you don't know? And I'd be like, if it was that bad, can you imagine what it feels like for an LGBT person who cannot access particular services? who is not valued or respected in society. So you know, she would nod, and that nod for me was a place where I felt like she started to understand. So I don't force it, I don't impose anything, but the tolerance stage, like how you tolerate mosquitoes when you go to the Caribbean, I'm happy with at the moment. So I'm also very proud to belong to a community of people, whether that's LGBT+, plus, whether that's trade unionists that have recognized the need to protect LGBT plus people, or whether we are asylum seekers or fellow workers or simply life's travelers. You know, as a trade unionist, I know all too well about the external pressures that um, are continuing with the marginalization of black and LGBT plus communities, the dismantling of public services, um, and services for black and LGBT people around vital health care and welfare support. The erosion of social and democratic institutions which lead, um, which are including community-based community groups and the growing tide of intolerance towards black and LGBT people in a context of severe economic inequality and financial instability which we know disproportionately will impact on black and LGBT plus people, as well as women, disabled, young and mature people. Um, and these all have such a devastating impact on us. And this is why in our work, when we talk about doing things and seeing it from an intersectional perspective, it's important to understand that intersectionality is about the barriers of oppression that exist. I had the fortunate pleasure to meet Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw last year. And by a show of hands, who knows who Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw is? Okay, so that's interesting, thank you. Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, Professor Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, was the woman who coined the word intersectionality in 1989. And it came from the work she was doing around uh, a, a case in a car plant which was impacting a, a black woman. And the case that was put forward was this woman felt she was discriminated at work and the employer said, okay, it's because you're a woman. But she says, no, it's because I'm a woman and I'm black. But the employer couldn't see that she could have a case of double discrimination. That oppression that exists within race and gender. So that was Kimberly Crenshaw's word, and it's a theory. So I'm going to go to the next slide. What I have spelt out here, intersectionality. Intersectionality is a concept often used in critical theories to describe ways in which oppressive institutions, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, xenophobia, classism, etc., are interconnected and cannot be examined separately 
from one another. So as I stand here, I don't want to have to just talk about my race and leave my sexuality at the door. I don't want to have to be seen and talk about my sexuality and leave my gender at the door. All of these, I don't want to talk, not talk about class and only race because that's my lived experience of the oppressions that I face based on race, gender, class, and sexuality. And that word intersectionality has lent itself to a number of other different characteristics. So when you look at when something intersects and meets, the moment you take away the fact that I'm a woman and will, have, will face sexism, misogyny, and I will be oppressed based on that. You take away part of my lived experience. It means that your campaigns, your work, your organizing, your everyday activity is not intersectional. So I had this diagram. For me, that middle part is the intersections of where those different facets meet. So as a black woman of a working class background, who's not a practicing Christian, but was raised as a Christian of a particular age, that's my life. And I can be discriminated based on those factors. I can be and have been and will be oppressed based on race because we know about structural systemic racism. So it talks about the overlapping or intersecting social <coughs> identities that relate to systems of oppression, domination, or discrimination. And that is what is ever so important for me when we look at UK Black Pride, when we look at our work within the trade union movement, when we are self-organizing in our trade union activities. We cannot talk about campaigning for LGBT rights and divorce the fact that you have black LGBT people who may be disabled, who will be women, who will be a number of different characteristics. So when you do that, when you just campaign for LGBT rights and you win on LGBT rights, who are you winning for? Because it's not everybody. And there mustn't be a hierarchy of equality. There certainly mustn't. We mustn't try and look at how one thing out trumps, bad word, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and trumps another. So if you will allow me to, I want to talk about UK Black Pride. UK Black Pride fills me with emotion when I talk about it because just the heartache to be able to bring UK Black Pride to the UK has been really tough. It was born out of frustration. It was born out of not seeing ourselves in everyday LGBT mainstream activities. So in 2004, when I was working alongside people like Bo, Kai, Maud, uh, a group of women which was BLOCK. BLOCK stands for Black Lesbians in the UK. We were doing some online activities and I said, how do we take this offline so people can see each other? So people can share in that shared commonality that we have. So I said, let's go to South End. People are like, are you crazy? You're going to take black queer women to South End? And we did. So, and the reason we went to South End is because growing up, we could never afford to go on holidays. And my father would always take us to places like Broadstairs, Margate, South End, you know, and I absolutely loved it because that's all I knew. So we took two busloads of women, lesbian, bi, trans women who were black, and I use black in its political context. And the joy that we had in that space as we celebrated, as we came together, as we held hands, as we listened to music, as we played volleyball, as we uh, ate jerk chicken and had rum punch, as we 
just claimed our space and was just us. We centered who we were as black, lesbian, bi, trans women. It was powerful. It was liberating. <coughs> So 2005, I'm trying to fast forward. As I walked back, actually, let me go back. As I walked back to the coach, I said to um, my then ex-partner, there's been a few of those, not very good relationships. You know, I said to them, I said, oh my gosh, this feels like the black pride you have in America. It feels like a coming together of, you know, us just being seen claiming our space. Historically, we, we don't get to claim our space. We're not centered. We don't see ourselves in everyday activities. We don't see ourselves in the, in the media in a positive light. Our narrative is normally shaped for us, but it wasn't. We centered us and we shaped our own narrative. Um, and somebody behind me said, oh, Phil, you are crazy about, you want to have a black pride in the UK? I always knew that you'll die, you know, for the cause, but somebody is going to kill you. And I said, you know, when you say that we can't, we turn around and say we can. You know, our forefathers and ancestors did not pave this way for us to sit back and be complacent. So for me, my conscience doesn't allow me to sit still, stay silent, and not do anything. So for a number of years, nobody would touch UK Black Pride, but we had Black Pride in 2005. We were resourceful, we were creative, we were innovative about where we got our money. We donated, we, we asked people, we got Marquee, somebody came with their jerk pan, we got somebody who came with their DJ decks, and we have grown. So 2005, 200 people, 2018, seven and a half thousand people. <laughs> so when you tell us that we can't exist in a space, we tell you to pep off. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's in 2010 when they had the, they called it riots, I might call it uprising, of the young people who, some young people, that were ever so vocal about what they wanted to say, they told us a day before that we're going to have to cancel UK Black Pride. And I cancel UK Black Pride, it was meant to be a, it was at Burbank University. And we said, why are you cancelling it? Because the riots and the attention and, you know, um, you know, the black community. I said, are you really saying riots and black community in the same breath? And you want to cancel UK Black Pride for that reason? And we have never had any trouble. It went ahead, but with more money that had to be invested in it. So, if I can... And if you allow me to, I want to talk about my blackness, my womanhood, my queerness. I wrote an open letter to queer people of colour. And if you will allow me to read this, because it says so much about everything that has gone on for us as the black LGBT plus community. So this open letter, on any given day, we experience any number of microaggressions. You're a little brown boy in Birmingham who doesn't walk like the other boys. You're a black woman being told to calm down. You're a black man getting the look you know all so well. The one that tells you, why are you here? You're a Middle Eastern descent, you're of Middle Eastern descent, and you have a beard, and people won't sit next to you on public transport. You are a woman who wears a hijab and you're getting cat calls. You're just trying to make it from point A to point B. On any given day, a group of people are debating your existence in the evening news. They are talking about crimes that don't affect them in places they have never stepped foot in. They are apologizing for lives they haven't helped 
they have helped break but will never fix. You are being judged because you look like what society thinks is a man, but you are wearing pink lipstick. You're being ravaged by the words designed to wound from the mouths of people too scared and too ignorant, too apathetic to understand the wounds are within. On any given day, someone is telling you to stand up straight and smile. All eyes are on you. Don't embarrass your family. No one will take you seriously. Why are you talking like that? Yeah, but you don't need to flaunt it in our faces. Or you're a chick with a dick. Go back home. Let me check your pockets. You should be grateful we've even allowed you into this country. Someone's trying to free you from the oppressions of Islam, save you from the savages of sitting in your own and mansplaining what feminism means. Someone who's never read bell hooks or really knows about Kimberly Crenshaw or Audre Lorde is telling you that intersectionality isn't a thing. A reprieve from the assaults of the course of life that we know so intimately is the reason UK Black Pride was set up. We need spaces for ourselves, spaces which we can let out a collective sigh of relief, spaces in which we are free from the gaze, spaces only our version of ourselves will do, the only version of ourselves that is allowed, the truest version of ourselves. Spaces which we are protected, spaces we fought for and we celebrate within. As we all know very well, the necessity, the necessity of spaces by us and for us hasn't worn either. But we continued with the growth of UK Black Pride that it isn't only because of space away from danger, but it's because we want to exist. As we gather together in our histories, our her stories and their stories, our cultures collide as we learn that we are not alone, that our pain is also our joy. And 13, 14 years down the line, a group of friends that traveled down to South End for the birth of what would be UK Black Pride was powerful. A busload of queer black folk that alighted to cut eyes under the, the breath of mutterings and yet, in that moment, even under the watchful and suspicious gaze of white people that walked past us, a celebration that took place there in South End, where a group of black queer folk connected. It didn't matter that we were of mixed descendants from Asia, Africa, Caribbean, Middle Eastern, and the United States. There, together, a group of us were there resisting, laughing, energizing under the banner of black lesbians in the UK. Of course, there was political blackness and it was more clear, clearly defined. They're more widely understood and it made sense that every non-white person would band together under the face of the same oppressions. That we would unite to strategize our way to freedom, that we would come together in defiance of those who didn't think we should be able to. There is an understanding that our experience, while completely individual, were interwoven as a part of tapestry of oppressions that cloaked us all in silence and muffled our demands for justice, equality, and freedom. Now, Audrey Lord reminds us that we do not have to be each other to know that our fight is the same. And as we move away from the political blackness, because a lot of people use people of color, BAME, BME. The diasporas in the 80s and the 90s and the early noughties, that's where we used it. It's important that we find a way to reimagine and revive that collectivism, the whoop that bound us so tightly together at the start of our journey. For us, we will always be UK Black Pride in name that will never change, but understand why that black today can feel so exclusive. So this last year, we assembled a powerhouse of a team. We went in search of amazing people to help contribute to the building and the growth of UK Black Pride. And we showed that you are welcomed and loved under the ages of Black Pride. How do you ensure everyone feels welcome? 
How do they know they are welcome at Black Pride? It's a question that we ask ourselves constantly. And every year where we expand our team, and last year where we met in the offices of Stonewall, we deliberated and we spoke about what shall we call our theme for 2018? And it was Shades of Diaspora. And that was to bring people together from all the different diasporas. As throngs and dancing brown and black bodies cheering for Diane Abbott ran through my mind as she, I recalled her speech that she made at UK Black Pride, I said that I get it. And that was our theme, going on our year-long mission to unite queer people of colour in Britain whose global roots shoot from Asia, Africa, Latin America to the Middle East and the United States and the Caribbean. It speaks to our growing theme and our siblings who show up to UK Black Pride each and every single year. The shades of our experience, it speaks to the complexity, the interwoven experiences of our asylum-seeking siblings and refugees. It speaks to the unique hurdles of our gay black brothers, the infuriating mountain of queer women of colour who, fa who face such tall turmoil around the world and the relentless attacks on our trans siblings. It speaks to our experiences as intersex siblings whose voices finally are rising up in a beautiful chorus. It speaks to the experiences that can't be named, but those who suffer in silence and those who cannot come out. It acknowledges our experiences are not all the same, but we will fight for a better future together. So when we had UK Black Pride in Vauxhall, we danced, we sang, we laughed, we cried, we protested. We put the politics back into Pride, and we don't forget that it's about people over profits. We listen, we exhale, and when we do, it tumbles out. All those microaggressions tumble out as we center ourselves, as we are in one space, enjoying each other. As we breathe in, our lungs and our belly fills up with mishaps, our black and brown bodies dance and praise in exaltation, we remember why we're here in this space, that moment, and we make everyone realize that you are perfect just the way you are. And I haven't, I wrote here, I wrote that open letter to such a cry baby. <laughs> I wrote that open letter to queer people of colour in the UK to let them know that I see you. I see you when nobody else sees you. Just like I was seen. It's so important to feel a place at which you belong. It's so important to know you can claim your space. It's also important for our white allies to understand that this space is centered around us, but they can, you can come and celebrate with us. It's not exclusive. It's not separate to part of the Pride family. It's very much part of the Pride movement. But whilst we don't live in an ideal world, there will always be a Black Pride. And we won't make any apologies for celebrating who we are. You guys are making me all so emotional. <laughs> and I just put here, when I wrote for a diva column, um, as a black lesbian woman, I've experienced every, pre every prejudice, challenge, and smack in the proverbial mind that you can imagine, from this workplace to any number of institutions and establishments. What I go through as a black woman at work and in society at large is so well documented. And so I use every opportunity to speak to other black women who may be queer, lesbian, disabled, working class, etc. So in my day job, my gay job, and being a mother, I'm radical in celebrating the first of the world that often tells me that I shouldn't be here, or that we are less than, or not worthy. And at times, this has surprised me, even though I know it to be so true. But I can't give up and won't give up. 
as I mentioned, I have a, a young daughter, well, 24, and there's a saying that my mum uses, you know, quite a bit. She says, you don't, you do not inherit this land from your parents. You borrow it from the next generation. So we all have a duty of care to really fertilize the ground and make sure that what we do in today, it's not about us, it's about the next generation that's gonna come along. People have paved the way for me to be here, so the least I can do is make sure that we retain the rights that we have, but try to go further and plant those seeds so when it blossoms, people like my beautiful daughter don't have to experience the horrendous, racist, sexist, misogynistic experiences that I have had. Now, I laugh every single day because I think it's good to laugh. But sometimes in reality, I'm in so much pain because it's not easy having to always speak to people, to always have to come out to people, to be shut down just because I'm talking about race, class, gender, and any other things which amount to injustices. It's not easy having the door shut on you time and time again. But many people, as I keep on saying, have come before us and we stand on the shoulders of giants. Now some people in this room may not understand my pain, my grief and my hurt, and that's fine, it's okay. But what I ask of you today is that when you leave this room, there has to be an understanding that my struggle is your struggle and your struggle is my struggle. Without that collective approach, we will never ever eradicate the injustices in society. When we come together and amplify our voices, turning up the volume on society, making it absolutely impossible for them to turn the volume down on us, that's where we make real change. That's how we make real change. So I just ask you that try and be patient and understanding with each other. You don't have to be black to stand with me when I'm holding a Black Lives Matter banner, but I want to know that there's solidarity. You don't have to have experienced sexism as a man. I want you to stand in solidarity with me when I'm marching. I may not be in a wheelchair or have had a, a, a disability but I will surely sit and stand beside my dis disabled comrades because I say, your struggle has to be my struggle and my struggle has to be your struggle. <sighs> wow, okay. So when I think about the past, I think of people like Femi Otsuju, who was the first black woman who was at the London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard. Feel, think of Olivette, who was one of the co-founding people of Stonewall. And I'm sure people don't know Olivette, who is a black woman. I think of the 50 year anniversary and the biggest foundational liberation movement that happened, which was the Stonewall riots, where trans and gender non-conforming people centered and led that movement. Those of you who've watched the film, you know, Stonewall and saw little Danny throw the brick, that was completely whitewashed, don't believe it. This was about Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, who led the Stonewall riots. So that's the past. <laughs> when I think about the present, today, our young people who, who are students, are NUS students, campaigning for their rights, campaigning just for EMA so they can survive and live. Thinking about also the hurt that our trans siblings have faced with the toxic debates around their lives. 
and I think sometimes people don't necessarily say anything when an injustice towards our trans siblings are happening, we stay silent. Now silence won't protect you and Audrey Lord says that loud and clear. But the present is looking good for UK Black Pride. We've just announced a partnership with Stonewall, <coughs> which this partnership seeks to support UK Black Pride in looking at how we build, grow and win, but more about our vision and our sustainability of UK Black Pride and making sure Stonewall, the largest, <coughs> biggest organisation that campaigns for LGBT rights, tries to understand intersectionality and that black and brown lives exist within LGBT+. Plus. Future, what's next? Well, I wasn't going to go for Prime Minister, but Theresa May seems to be messing that up royally. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that completely fair. But the future is whatever we want it to be and whatever it may look like, but centering all of us, campaigning for equality, freedom, and justice, making sure that that next generation the people that we pass the baton on to don't have to go through what we're going through. And that's my past, present and future. So I just ask you, get involved with UK Black Pride. And the reason to get involved in UK Black Pride, because it's brilliant, I'm biased slightly, but <laughs> who's been to UK Black Pride in here? Oh, I need more hands than that. Really? <laughs> Money. I've seen like three, four hands. We're going to coach, we're going to coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, getting involved, whether you volunteer, whether you just donate, whether you share something that you've seen on Facebook, because when you think about 51% of black, Asian, and uh, minority ethnic LGBTQ plus people, that have experienced discrimination or poor treatment from others in their local LGBTQ uh, plus community because of their identity is really sad. And then the rise to 61% for black LGBTQ plus people, and that was through Stonewall's research. That's unacceptable. And UK Black Pride doesn't and will not stand for that. So we've got to think about how do we do more to make sure we don't have such high statistics, statistics and numbers like that. That was UK Black Pride. I was going to try and embed a video into it. It just got too technical, so I put a picture. But 7,500 people that were in attendance at 2018 UK Black Pride. This year it will take place on the 7th of July, a new venue to be um, and you are all invited, as long as you know that no one must dress better than me on the day. <laughs> and I wanted to leave you because of my five minutes. Is it still five minutes? No. <laughs> <laughs> as we try to... So, Audrey Lord, who I love, I, you know, you know when you just luxuriate in someone's book, their writings, their essays, you smell the book, you breathe the book, you eat the book, you drink the book. Audrey Lord was talking about intersectionality before the word was even coined. In our work and in our living, we must recognize that our difference is a reason for celebration and growth rather than a reason for destruction. So I want to thank you, because I haven't got five minutes left. <laughs> for allowing me to be here and speak to you. I hope that if anything, there's one thing that you take away from what I've said, and I will go back to your struggle has to be my struggle, and my struggle has to be your struggle. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here.
bill for just yeah, inspirational words really very moving. Um we need to get the coach to go to Black Coach. Um I think and go and see what it's all about. Um so save your questions if you've got them for Lady Phil until the Q&A. Um, I'm now um, really excited to um, introduce um, Chief Inspector Karen Weaver, a formidable champion of equality and diversity. Um, she's been a police officer for 27 years. Um, she's currently managing the introduction of policing education education framework, um, which will see some significant changes for entry into policing. Um, she is the staff officer to Assistant Chief Constable Julie Cook from Merseyside Police. Um, and Julie Cook herself is the National Police Chief's Council Lead for LGBT+. Um, Karen is really, a, really a, a champion of equality and diversity and fairness. Um, and we're really delighted that she's been able to kind of um, spare some time to come and speak to us about best practice today. So. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you less, um, much, that's not right, is it? <laughs> Look, to put me after Lady Phil. <laughs> <laughs> How on earth I can make that, other than obviously we're both in our early 20s, so I can make the baby. Um, I've been asked to speak not at all about me today, it's about staff support networks and to talk about top tips, I suppose, for introducing and managing staff support networks. So that's what I'll talk about. Um, and there's an intersectionality link certainly throughout all of that. Um, I'm female, I'm mixed race, um, unfortunately I'm married to a man, but um, he's a great joiner, he does kitchens, bathrooms, so I'm sure you'll forgive me for that, for that part of it. Right, let me get my... Okay, so top tips on staff support networks. And I suppose the first thing to think about is what's the point of them. And we do get asked quite regularly, what is the point of having a female network? a black police association, an LGBT network, a disability association, and the networks that we have. And on the contrary to that, we get asked quite regularly, but it feels quite regularly, uh, why is there no straight man's mm. white police association? <laughs> and to, to know, I'm glad you laugh because I've stopped laughing about it now. Or I've probably started laughing hysterically about it, I'm not too sure which it is. Um, and so we do have to explain every so often, why? Why do we need a support network to support staff who, as Lady Phil's talked about, there is discrimination, there's prejudice, there's disadvantage, there's bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious bias. So we have to support people. Um, and anyone that asks that question, why do we not have a straight man's or a white man's or whatever it might be, a, a nice intersectional um, straight white, um, middle class, whatever it might be, association. You probably need to sit down and have a conversation rather than ask daft questions. Um, maybe controversial. I didn't look at this on the big, street, big screen, so that's doing my eyes already just mm -hmm. watching that, so I do apologise. Um, so keeping it professional and business, which is what this section's about for you, um, I've got four top tips, four top tips for staff support networks after you've stopped doing the hysterical laughing when they ask why on earth you need one. And the first really is to define the purpose. Now, we do have, I suppose, a luxury in some ways about the support that we get within Merseyside Police for establishing and maintaining um, and managing staff support networks. So we have got that support that I'll talk to you about, but I think you need the rationale, you need to understand why you need it and what the purpose of it is. So this is a little bit about the purpose that we have for our staff support networks. It's a business, it's part of a business, there's performance, there's governance, there's meetings around it, and it's not a hobby. People think it's a bit of a hobby, something you're doing in your own time because it's a nice thing to do for people. Well, it isn't. It is extra work, but it's part of our core business. We don't always see it like that, but it is and should be part of core business. It's 
it's not a luxury, it's not an add-on, it's what we do to manage our business. So we do have, have to understand what the point of the network is. Why do you need it? And there's, there's generally uh, good grounds to have a staff support network. So what is it there for? What are the aims? What are the objectives? And what will that network be doing? So if you're going to ask for a staff support network, be re really clear in your rationale what it is you want from it, what are you going to be doing, and have a strategy, have a plan, and have some core business, and it fits into core business. And we do sometimes see it as an add-on. We see equality, diversity, inclusion sometimes as an add-on to core business that is a luxury that when we're short of time and resources and energy and finances, it drops to the bottom of our list. The staff support networks should be pushing it right back up to the top of that list because that's what allows us to perform well and manage our business. Um, tip number two was to have some clear communication. So understand as part of your business, as part of the university, as part of policing, what you have as staff support networks. Be clear so that the rest of the organisation understands who it is, who to contact, what they do, who they include, and who will be supported by that staff support network. So clear communication, whether it's a strategy, whether it's on internal communications, external communications, be clear as to what the network is, what it does, and have some branding. So for us, we have the Disability Support Network, the Merseyside Black and Asian Police Association, and Dominique sat there as our current chair. We have Parity 21, which is a gender network. It was our female support network or a women's network. What Parity 21 have done is open it up to gender. Uh, contentious, but well, that's what we've got there. Uh, the Part-time and flexible, net, flexible working network. We have a faith network. Now our faith network is the Catholic Police Guild and our Christian Police Association. So we don't have a separate Jewish network, Muslim, Sikh, or the faith networks, if anywhere they're going to sit within the Merseyside Black, Police and, uh, Black and Asian Police Association. And we also have um, our LGBT network. So those are our networks, our staff support networks. It's clear, they're branded, we know where they are, we know who chair them, um, and we know how to make contact. Okay, I suppose the first thing, understand the business benefit. And I, and I am quite keen that anything that we do, certainly within policing, um, we have less resources, less funding, all the austerity measures that I'm sure people know about. So for us to spend time and energy on equality and diversity work and allowing staff support networks to flourish, um, we have to really understand what we're going to get back for the organisation. And it's not about being nice to people and looking after people, although of course that comes into it. It's about making sure that our staff, because this is an internal focus for our staff support networks, we do a lot of external um, events, campaigns, whatever it might be, we do have an external focus, but the main focus for our staff support networks is internal to support staff. But we get a big business benefit from having it. Because if you're looking after your staff, you're looking after your colleagues and your peers, um, and you're supporting them to be in work, to not be off sick because of stress and bullying and discrimination, to support people who are going through recruitment and promotion processes so that we get the right people in, so that we reflect our community and we have better diversity and representation, the organisation benefits. So we're not doing it because we're nice people, although of course I am. We're doing it because there's a good business benefit. It helps us to help the community. So if we have our staff support networks working with the organisation, then we're more likely to attract the right people to come and work with us and work for us. <coughs> we should be working, um, and we're, we're sometimes are, we're sometimes not, but we should be working with our, within our recruitment strategy. 
So we should be helping our recruitment teams to recruit the right people, whether that's in selection processes, whether it's attending <coughs> careers fairs, talking about what Merseyside Police as an organisation is and how we can better represent the community if we have diverse people joining us that should be part of the role of staff support networks because we want to be um, within a staff support network <coughs> visible to our communities and attracting people to come and work with us. People leave our organisation because of prejudice and discrimination and bias and because we haven't been treated very well because of those protective characteristics. That's not, new, new, not unique to policing, that will happen nationwide for a wide variety of different reasons. And what we should be doing within staff support networks is supporting people to stay in our organisation. We have developed people, we've got high levels of skills, experience and qualities, and we shouldn't be losing people because we haven't treated them well because of their protective characteristic. Similar to all those themes um, is around progression, getting the right people <coughs> in the right places through progressing through the ranks, progressing through the, the, through the grades, to have people as decision makers who understand what it's like to be black, to be gay, to be disabled, um, any of those protective characteristics. We need those people with those experiences, that knowledge and understanding in positions where they can influence and make change and make decisions. Um, I've talked about our representation. We need to represent our community. We need to understand our community. And if we have people in our organisation supported by staff support networks, then we can influence that change. Um, one of the things that staff support networks should be allowed uh, and entitled to is data. Data around um, <coughs> your status, your employment status, your community status, the numbers of people, um, what groups and communities people belong to, so that you understand that representation. If you don't know the business and you don't know the data as a staff support network, what are you doing? H how do you drive change and influence change if you don't know your data? And we've battled and battled with this because people will say, well, it's data protection. Can't tell you how many black and Asian and minority ethnic people we have in the organisation because it's data protection. It's not. It really just isn't. So you have to, and I know it's on another slide, have some courage um, and have a voice and speak up. If you're going to be in a staff support network, whether it's chair, committee, or be involved, you need some courage and you need to speak up. Um, if we have the right people in place and staff support networks, are supporting the organisation, then staff confidence and satisfaction will be higher. And certainly for us, our main aim and main priority is having community satisfaction and community confidence. And if we have the right people in place, supported by our networks, who understand our communities, then our communities will be more confident, more satisfied with what we do as a policing organisation. Um, we debate, um, discuss, fall out, cry, argue, whatever I might do at some point in the week around equality and equity. <coughs> and so when I have somebody who says, well, why can't I have a support network? Or why are they getting that extra? Or why are you doing positive action? Because it's not fair. It's not about everyone having the same and everyone being equal and the same and getting the same because... Dominique, Michelle, Jill, people from our organisation, Mandy, people need something that's different. So I need something as a female with children, mixed race, very different to somebody else who's very different to me. So it's about equity, people getting what's right and what's fair and what they deserve to be able to be in the organisation and deliver and perform really well. It's not about us all getting the same. And again, our focus is community first. Our community first ethos says, whatever we're doing, we must consider the community impact. Having staff support networks, working around diversity, equality, inclusion, the impact on our communities can only be beneficial. 
And I say that having listened to what Lady Phil's just said about our trans community and some events that we've just run um, with organisations to support people around trans, transitioning in the workplace, um, and we've invited lots of our partners to these. We've had an awful lot of abuse, um, and, and one of our trans officers had about 300 uh, comments of abuse in one day over the fact that we're working with the trans community and supporting trans individuals in the organisation and in our community. So what we are doing should have a positive impact, but we have to courageous, be courageous, take risks, and do what's right, even knowing we will get some negativity around it, and challenge that negativity and remain focused on what the aim is. And part of that is our reputation. Our reputation, if we listen to a small section of people uh, nationally around what we do with trams, some people will think, what are you doing spending all that money on that? What are you doing marching at Pride in uniform? All of those police officers in the summer walking, marching, um, through Liverpool and we've had a couple of hundred certainly the last couple of years marching in uniform we will get an awful lot of negativity um, by people saying it's a waste of money a waste of time but the community impact and the inclusion and our reputation is around from my point of view doing something really positive around diversity equality and inclusion that actually is a long-term goal so we will spend an awful lot on that one day a half a day but with a great deal of benefit from it um, and I suppose the tip within this one is to value the people that are in your staff support networks because it's not an easy job um, and I've been involved in staff support networks for a long time it doesn't do an awful lot of favors <coughs> nobody gets promoted because of it mm -hmm. <clears throat> you don't get any glory any reward any recognition um, it's a hard job so please value those people who put their head above the parapet and challenge the organisation, challenge the norm to make a difference because you don't get any extra money, extra time because it's on top of your day job probably. So it's about valuing those people. Um, and my last slide, performance, governance and challenge. Again, it's that business stuff. It's not a nice thing to do, it's the right thing to do but there's a business benefit and you need to have some business goals. <clears throat> what we say within our service level agreement and what we talk about for our staff support networks is you're not here to have a nice time, to run events, to go to careers fairs, to just have nice meetings. It's about being a critical friend to the organisation because the organisation will get it wrong. We'll get it wrong because quite often we're led by people who haven't walked in our shoes because they're not of a particular gender, or ethnicity, or race, or with a disability, or faith, or whatever it might be, quite often the people in power don't have that experience, haven't lived it. Lots of empathy potentially, not always, but lots of empathy, but they haven't got that shared experience, that life experience, that makes people understand what it's like when somebody says no, and you think, you've said yes to all of these people, you've said no to me. What is it that you're looking at that has made you say no? So we need to be a critical friend to the organisation to say stop doing what you're doing because it's wrong. You need to have that courage to speak up and challenge the organisation. <coughs> or nationally or speak up wherever. Um, team ethos, and that comes back to, and I know it's going to come up in a minute, but intersectionality. So we have those six uh, staff support networks. What we need to have is some team ethos within that. They should all be working together, and again, a bit like uh, Lady Phil said there, my struggle is your struggle. So the LGBT network and the Merseyside Black, Poli Black and Asian Police Association, what was also said earlier is a hierarchy, and there shouldn't be a hierarchy. There is a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy in policing, which will say that Black and Asian Police Association and they do have a bigger voice nationally than the disability networks, the LGBT networks, and the drive nationally is around a BAME focus. So we have to be strong and say, think about those BAME people who are LGBT or with a disability or female, and if you're focusing on one, make sure it's inclusive of all. So I understand the focus and different community focus, but 
We want to work as a team and support each other. Data I've talked about. Intersectionality, um, and it might come up, I don't know, but in the Risa Black and Asian Police Association, for example, you don't have to be black to get in, you don't have to be Asian to get in, or Polish or whatever it might be. It's an open staff support network because actually, if we limit it to certain people, we're negating loads of shared and other experiences and power and influence. But if we included that within the network, we can do bigger and better things together. So it's an open network. The LGBT network's slightly different, but it has an allies program. So just consider what your network is, what do you want from it, who is it set up to support, and who's included. Who are you going to include to achieve your aims? Um, have a national outlook and a national perspective. Look at what's happening nationally, not just your local Liverpool or wherever it might be uh, community, because nationally, um, certainly for us, through the National Police Chiefs uh, Council, the Home Office, the College of Policing, there's a lot of support and guidance and information out there, and certainly through academia, um, to drive what we do and how we do it, and for us to, um, to have a, a national voice about the issues that affect us locally. Uh, one of the things that we do uh, within Merseyside Police for each of our staff support networks is we have a Chief Officer Sponsor. We can't get any higher locally, so each one of the networks has a Chief Officer who sponsors the network. Um, and that sponsor is support um, and has that voice at Chief Officer level to represent the views of the staff support network. Um, it, it's still something I've spoken about already, but use positive action. It's there, it's within the legislation. There are issues with how it's used, but give some consideration to the things that the law allows you to use to support your people. And positive action is one of those for attraction, recruitment, retention, progression. Consider what's available to you to make that difference. For us, and we are quite different, and we've just spoken about it at a meeting this morning actually, um, we are given funding for our staff support networks. So it is about valuing who they are and what they do. What better value than to give them some money to be able to do it. So we are given some funding for each of the staff support networks and the chair of the network and the committee within the network are given some time to perform their business as well. It doesn't always work like that because people have a, a full-time day job and they do end up doing it over and above uh, their primary role but the organisation not only values the fact that we have staff support networks but gives us some money and some time to do it as well. Um, and link into the community. We have a variety um, of links to our community engagement unit. We have community action groups. We've set up uh, last year a trans community action group. And so I went to the last one and asked some questions around some trans work that we're doing around vetting and searching. And who better to ask than the members of the public um, who live it and experience it and have that interaction with the police that may or may not always be very good to advise us on what we're doing and how we do it. Have a service level agreement. Um, have a buy-in with your management or with your business as to what you're allowed, what you can do, who's going to do it, and let them to sign up to allowing you to perform your business as a staff support network with some agreed protocols that actually bind the organisation and bind the network to deliver some results. Um, and have some courage. Um, know your business, understand what you're doing, understand what your aims are, use your heart and have some courage to challenge when things aren't right because that's what the networks are about. Not just about a cuddle here and there and some support for people. That is a primary focus obviously. It's about challenging and speaking up when things aren't right. And have some debate, have some um, conflict Conflict is a negative thing. I tell my husband that sometimes. <laughs> uh, have some debate. This is the issue, what do we think? And I might leave the room and never agree with you, 
But as long as we have a professional debate and we learn from it and share that learning, what results we have might not be what I wanted, but it's about listening to other people's opinions, having a debate and working out what's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. session now and um, I just want to extend a thank you again to Karen for coming along and, and sharing that with us really and um, there'll be some people in the room that are maybe considering a second